Good morning. How's everyone this fine day? Let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, oh, thank you so much for this time. To look in your word, and you continue to study Ezekiel and to learn from him as you uh, showed him some things about your personality, about your what things that uh, you like and dislike, and you help us to understand how we can apply these things to our lives. We give you all praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, calling this part two of that chapter 23, uh, the parable of uh, Ahiola and Ahiobi. And, we, and if you remember, if you watched yesterday's, then uh, first we took on uh, A-H-O-L-A-H, which is the Northern Kingdom, or better known as Israel at the time, or Samaria, uh, another name for it, because Samaria was the capital of it. So you can kind of get an idea where, the, where Samaria came from. And today we're going to take the second half of this chapter 23. Uh, actually, uh, it's not the second half. I kind of broke this down, and it'll, it'll probably take three or four days total. So this is, I guess, the, this is finishing the first half, I should say. He's talking about this parable about uh, the north and south. And so today will be about uh, the southern part. And for those that didn't get a chance to uh, see yesterday, just to give you a little map and idea of what we're talking about. The northern part we see in this is blue, and that's Samaria uh, area. That's, that's It was known as Israel uh, as a general term, even though there was uh, all 12 tribes are included in both areas. Uh, it's just that uh, the dominant tribe of each area kind of became the name of that area. And so, uh, Israel, which you remember, was the uh, given name to uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the twelve of the tribe. I can't remember which one now. Uh, and so it kind of took on the name of Israel. It actually, uh, actually had a different name. Now I can't think of it. But Samaria is a better known name for it now. And then Judea being the tribe of uh, of that Jesus came through. And so these are the two kingdoms, and in the southern kingdom there, uh, Jerusalem is the capital. And uh, it encompassed that area there. And you see all around it a different, uh, this, this particular map is about from about 700 BC. So because uh, where we're at now in Ezekiel, the northern kingdom has been taken over uh, already by the Assyrians. And uh, the people dispersed throughout uh, the whole uh, known world at that time. So dealing most with the southern kingdom. But in this particular chapter, God is having Ezekiel point out that uh, the sins of the north are now also that the sins of the south, that they didn't take heed the warning from what the north did wrong. And now they're doing them and even doing them worse. Uh, so that's uh, give you a little quick rundown there of where we're at. And so let's jump into the text. Get rid of my double picture again. <laughs> so just to uh, re, uh, refresh our memory, uh, he uh actually the name itself stands for my tent is in her. So that name was given uh, in this particular passage to indicate uh, Jerusalem has the temple in it. So that's God's house. So the name given there actually uh, signifies that uh, God's house is in uh in there, where the uh, the other uh, term that we were talking about yesterday, Ahaloa, uh, actually stands for. Uh, sorry, I wrote it down. Her own tent, which means that she built her own tents, her own worship places that weren't uh, ordained by God. Uh, so those are the two names came from. And it kind of signifies them as being sisters, the uh, idolatrous sisters of the uh, of God. Of, uh, it's interesting that uh, Jewish nation Israel is, is always uh, referenced in a uh, re marriage relationship with God as the uh, adulterous uh, wife of uh, Jehovah, God. And so this is uh, this same frame of mind is being used in this parable. I'll give you a warning that when we get to uh, verse 20, 
Uh, it's rather a strange verse. And if there's any uh, young people listening, uh, turn off your ears because uh, it gets a little spicy. Uh, I don't know if uh, if you've ever written, uh, it's funny, some of the things you can read in the Bible, if you really study them, you would get an uh, interesting thought about that these things are actually in the Bible. And verse 20 is a little bit like that. And so uh, I'll give the warning right now. But I think you all, you may not even notice it because unless you study the words that are in there, you may not know what it stands for. But uh, some interesting, I was looking up a word and I found out some of the other words that are in that same verse are kind of uh, mean something kind of interesting. Anyway, uh, it's funny that uh, I heard a story once that Jewish boys, when they were first learning the, the uh, Torah, uh, uh, actually the, the Septuagint, which would be the which includes the Psalms, Proverbs, all the other all the prophets, all the Old Testament, that they weren't allowed to read Song of Solomon until they were at least thirty years old, because it's so uh, kind of uh, spicy, <laughs> uh, lack of a better word. So this verse is kind of along that same lines. Anyways, when we get to it, well, I'll. Uh, I'll be uh, as clean as possible about it. So starting in verse, uh, I'm just gonna review uh, again, uh, verse, we left off at verse 11 yesterday. And when her sister Haloibai saw this, she was more corrupt in her inordinate love than she and in her whoredoms more than her sister and her, her whoredoms. So here God through Ezekiel is telling them that, uh, I would hope that you, you know, basically saying, I wish you would have, paid attention to why I destroyed your sister, the Northern Kingdom, because you're doing you're doing even things even worse. Uh, during the time frame that uh, the Assyrians were attacking the North, they, that uh, they were actually uh, saying, uh, aha, yeah, you know, God's mad at you, you know, we're good, you know. So kind of like mocking the Northern Kingdom for their idolatry. But here, uh, God is kind of pointing out, well, you're just as bad as them, if not worse. So. Uh, Moving into the new text this week, today I mean, verse 12, she dotted upon the Assyrians, her neighbors, captains and rulers, clothed with gorgeous horsemen riding upon horses, all of them desirable young men. This is kind of leading in this uh, kind of a symbolic direction. Uh, and it, it has a, a kind of a double meaning, but it can kind of uh, imagine that what he's pointing out here is that the, uh, they become idolatrous by looking to the world for their for their uh, pleasure. And they saw these uh, different countries around them and the things that they were doing, and they were inspiring to them. They really enjoyed uh, those worldly things, just like now, you know, you, you, uh, you hear about all these different things that uh, God really is against, but that people enjoy them because they're, they're kind of fun, even though that uh, they are not, or, uh, that's the word I'm looking for, condoned by God. The same thing was happening back then. Not much changed in 2,700 years. So in Ezekiel 16, 28, talks about this bit. Thou hast played the whore also with the Assyrians, because thou wast unsatable. Yea, and thou hast played the harlot with them, and yet couldst not be satisfied. Again, God is using these terms that kind of uh, symbolize that uh, the people are be, are acting just like an adulterous wife would to a husband who's being faithful to them, but they're not being faithful to him. That's kind of the symbology here. I found a great passage over in Second Kings that helps explain this whole thing, what's going on. So it's chapter 16, and I'm going to read verses 7 through 15. So Ahaz, this is, a, this is talking about the northern kingdom. I'm sorry, no, this is talking about the southern kingdom. Ahaz sent messengers to kill a Plazar, king of Assyria, saying, I am my servant, and thy son came up and saved me out of the hand of the king of Syria, and out of the hand of the king of Israel, which raised up against me. And Ahaz took the silver and the gold that was found in the house of the Lord and the treasure of the king's house and sent it for a present to the king of Assyria. And you see right here that uh, already doing something wrong. He's taking things that belong to God and giving them to a pagan king. And the king of Assyria hearkened unto him. So the king of Assyria went up against Damascus and took it and carried the people of it captive to Kerr and slew Rezin. 
And King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet Tegapleser, king of Assyria, and saw an altar that was at Damascus. And King Ahaz sent to Uriah the priest, the fashion of the altar and the pattern of it according to all the wood workmanship thereof. Now, I keep in mind here that this, this pre, that uh, the Assyrians were uh, were idol worshiping uh, nation, so that this particular altar was an altar for uh, pagan gods. And here we have the king of uh, Judea getting wanting to copy it because he likes the way it looks. And Uriah the priest built an altar according to all that King Ahaz had sent from Damascus. So Uriah the priest made it against King Ahaz came from Damascus. And when the king was come from Damascus, the king saw the altar and the king approached to the altar and offered thereon. Now here we're breaking two rules. Uh, one thing is that, that uh, when it comes to offering anything in the temple, only the priest can. Kings were never allowed to offer any sacrifice in the temple. So he's breaking two rules. It's on the wrong altar, and it's also being done by the king himself. And he burnt his burnt offering and his meat offering and poured his drink offering and sprinkled the blood of the, his peace offering upon the altar. And he brought also the brazen altar, which was before the Lord from the forefront of the house, from between the altar and the house of the Lord, and put it on the north side of the altar. So here we took God's altar and moved it outside of where it's supposed to be so he can make room for his altar. He's breaking all kinds of rules here. And King Ahaz commanding Uriah the priest, saying, Upon this great altar burn the morning burnt offering and the evening meat offering and the king's burnt sacrifice and the meat offering with the burnt offering of all the people of the land and their meat offering and their drink offerings and sprinkle it upon all the blood of the burnt offering and all the blood of the sacrifice and the brazen altar shall be for me to inquire by. So you can see already that uh, uh, King Ahaz is, is breaking about every rule that God had for the for what type of uh, thing should be sacrificed in the temple and how it should have been done. And also in 2 Chronicles 28, 16 through 23 also adds to this. And at that time, the King Ahaz sent unto the kings of Assyria to help him. So here King Ahaz is getting in friendly, friendly with Assyria, and that uh, he's already built an offer, and he's going to continue to blaspheme God by uh, offering sacrifices now for uh, this king uh, of Assyria. Second Chronicles 28, 17, for again the Edomites had come and smitten Judea and carried away captives. So this, so what Judea is concerned about is that the uh, this is during the time frame that the uh, northern kingdom is being taken over. And the southern kingdom, uh, King Ahaz, is getting nervous. So he's trying to make good with uh, Assyria to stop them from coming and taking them too. <clears throat> the Philistines also had invaded the cities of the low country and of the south of Judea that had taken Dethamesh and Ajoilan and Gilderoth and Sirocco with the villages thereof and Timanah with the villages thereof, and Gimzo also in the villages thereof, and they dwelt there. Now, the Philistines were also working in the south of uh, Judea, taking all those areas. So he's getting, uh, Judea is getting nervous that uh, they're going to get hit from both sides. Kind of reminds me of today a little bit. For the Lord brought Judea low because of Ahaz, king of Israel, but he made Judea naked and transgressed sore against the Lord. And Tilga Plesser, king of Assyria, came unto him and distressed him, but strengthened him not. For Ahaz took away a portion out of the house of the Lord and out of the house of the king of the, and of the princes and gave it unto the king of Assyria, but he helped him not. And in the time of his distress did he trespass yet more against the Lord. This is that king Ahaz. For he sacrificed unto the gods of Damascus, which smote him, and he said, Because the gods of the kings of Assyria helped them, therefore will I sacrifice to them. But they may not help me, but they were the ruin of him and all of Israel. So here he thought he was trying to please Assyria, and that didn't work. Uh, and instead of turning to God, who would have helped him, and, and realized that, uh, he's going to even do a, a further uh, attack by trying to get try to get somebody else to help him. And that would be Babylon. That's coming up next. It's back to Ezekiel 
Then I saw that she was defiled, that they took both one way. Now, what's happening here is the fact that uh, basically God is going to remove everyone around uh, Judea except Judea. Uh, so that uh, all that's going to be left is Judea, I saw there in the map. Pretty much as of this point, everything around them has already been taken by uh, different uh, entities that God is allowing, uh, mainly because uh, of the uh, the way these people are not uh, turning to God and trying to do it themselves. So in 2 Kings 17, 18 and 19, Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. And also Judah kept not the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the statutes of Israel, which they made. So here uh, in King, they're talking about the Judea was starting to act just like uh, the northern kingdom of Israel did. Okay, Ezekiel 23, 14. Remember back in Ezekiel, uh, let me read this first, Ezekiel 23, 14. And as she increased her whoredoms, for when she saw men portrayed upon the wall, the images of the Chaldeans portrayed with vermilion. And just so you know, uh, that term vermilion uh, actually means it's, uh, it's uh, dyed or tinged with bright red. So that's what vermilion means. There's a few words here that I had to look up just to see what they, uh, what they meant. And remember back in Ezekiel 8.10, we were talking about these idols of Egypt put on the temple walls. So I'll refresh our memory. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creepy things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. So these were uh, all these different, if you saw the list of, and there's hundreds of them, of uh, these idols that the uh, Egyptians worshipped, they had a lot to do with different bugs and different snakes and different beasts. And so the uh, here Judea is done to paint them on the temple walls of God's house. And so he's re, uh, he's commenting about it here in verse 14. Okay, verse 15. Girded with girdles upon their loins, exceedingly and dye attired upon their heads, all of them princes to look to, after the man, manner of the Babylons of Chaldea, the land of their nativity. So now he's going to turn to Babylon to help him out against the Assyrians. And as soon as she saw them with her eyes, she darted upon them and sent messengers unto them in the Chaldea. So again, this idea behind the adulterous wife of uh, God, they're going, to, they're going to the world, they're going to the Babylonians to try to help them uh, to, uh, to uh, in this situation, instead of turning to God. And so God's re reminding uh, the people about this whole scenario. Over in Ezekiel 16, 29, uh, it also talks about this. Thou hast moreover multiplied thy fornication in the land of Canaan unto Chaldea, and yet thou wast not satisfied herewith. So here, uh, being that they're not going according to God's plan, they went to the Babylon to try to get help. Uh, and uh, what God is pointing out here that uh, that didn't satisfy you, did it? Uh, and that basically... Kind of like the same idea I like to think about, uh, you know, adultery in general. If you find that most people that uh, do do that sort of thing, find out in the long run that it's not, it's, it doesn't bring them much pleasure in the long run. It might be fun for a bit, uh, particularly if there's a, a large age gap uh, where uh, you'll sometimes see older men, they'll get this, what they call the, uh, uh, what's it called? <laughs> Well, you go and buy a sports car and they, uh, all of a sudden they want to go back to their youth. And God will even comment about that here in a minute. That they'll try to relive their uh, their younger days by uh, changing their clothing and maybe wanting to uh, get a divorce and marry a young wife and uh, that kind of thing. And usually it ends up being uh, you're not satisfied. And God's pointing that out here kind of. But it's also about uh, it's also about the lust of the eyes, and this is where it's kind of getting, getting into what I was going to talk about. When we get to verse twenty, is that they actually 
they actually were uh, so indulged in the worldly pleasures that they were performing. Uh, they were doing all kinds of idolatrous acts. And you got to remember that this is coming out of a time frame when Solomon, they just Solomon, the last uh, their kingdom, it was only a couple hundred years ago. But the people had gotten used to the idea that uh, if it felt good, do it. And it was the lust of the eyes uh, has a lot to do with uh, when you see something that's desirable, you want it. And uh, Solomon was guilty of it. And if you read Song of Solomon, it's actually uh, a love song to uh, to his favorite wife. But that uh, he goes on after that point uh, in Lamentations, where uh, <clears throat> I think it's called, I mean uh, Ecclesiastes, where he actually has realized that it didn't it didn't satisfy him, and that uh, he disobeyed God. There's other places in the Bible that the same thing happened. I thought I'd point out a few. Going all the way back to Genesis 6, when Genesis 3, 6, remember that uh, Eve uh, got, uh, got looking at some fruit and that uh, it uh, really looked appealing to her. And she was convinced by the uh, by Satan to uh, take a bite, that God's not going to kill him. I guess read it here in Genesis 3, 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, uh, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Uh, similar thing over in uh, Genesis 6, 2. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men that were fair, and they took them wide of all that they chose. Just a couple of examples of when uh, we let our eyes do something that we think is uh, very desirable looking. I remember the famous story of uh, of uh, King David and Bathsheba. You know, he was where he shouldn't have been, looking where he shouldn't have been looking, and saw some that he desired and uh, took advantage of that, being that he was a king, and ended up being his fall. And in fact, the child that came out of that union uh, died uh, because of it. And that he, uh, yeah, he ended up repenting. And to the Lord, a great uh, story of repentance, and he ended up being a great king overall. But that uh, the lust of the eyes will get you every time. Back to Ezekiel twenty three seventeen. And the Babylonians came to her into the bed of love, and they defiled her with their whoredom, and she was polluted with them, and her mind was alienated from them. So here. Uh, they seek to get to Babylon, and they came at first and helped out. But uh, uh, again, uh, God is not pleased, and so that uh, ultimately it ends up that Babylon is going to end up taking them and uh, destroying them. As we know, that's where we're heading. Kind of reminds me a little bit of a marriage in general. You know, where uh, that uh, typically. You know, one will get desires outside the marriage and go and seek another. And that's where adultery comes in. And that uh, and that, that that love relationship that they first had when they first got married turns into a hatred uh, pretty much at the end. Because the uh, divorces can get very, very nasty uh, when they, uh, and the interesting verse over in Second Samuel about Amnon, it kind of reflects this. Second Samuel 13, 15. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherein he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Ammon said unto her, Arise, be gone. And so he sent her away. Uh, that the love that they once shared, whatever it was, I don't remember the story off the top of my head, but uh, uh, their, during the process of their uh, separation, he got so hatred with her that he sent her away. So Ezekiel 23, 18. And this reminds me of another, another story uh, that I'll mention here in a minute. So she discovered her whoredom and discovered her nakedness. Then my mind was alienated from her like as my mind was alienated from her sister. So God is done to, uh, basically he's going to turn his, uh, turn his, uh, turn away from uh, this kingdom also for not, Turning back to him, turning back to God. That's what the the, the uh, 
or the mice and the stuff we're talking about here. And uh, over in Isaiah, uh, very similar situations talked about uh, that happened. Isaiah 3, 9. The show of their continents doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hid it not, woe unto their souls, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. So another example of a, a city that turned to some sort of a, uh, a type of, uh, uh, what do you call this? Uh, can't think of the right word now. Sexual misconduct, uh, similar to other, like adultery, but uh, similar, where uh, it's against God's perfect uh, example of uh, marriage between a husband and wife and ended up destroying the city because, uh, because they were so blatant about it. Some people say that the reason that uh, they destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah wasn't so much for the uh, sexual sin was that uh, it was condoned by the government. So Jeremiah 8.12 also reflects on this. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore shall they fall among them that fall. In the time of their visitation, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Over in Hosea, say, what a great story. Uh, it's one of my favorites of true love between a husband and wife. Here's a husband and wife. Uh, the wife went off to, uh, she was uh, enticed by the world. Perfect example. And uh, she ended up uh, uh, going on her way and forgetting her faithful husband who stood in the in the background still loving her but let her go and she ended up being uh, being tossed away like we read there in uh, second Samuel tossed out by the uh, desire the, the thing that she desired and ended up being put to the slave market and the husband finding out she was being sold as a slave went and Took everything he had to pay for her to went to uh, to get her off his, out of slavery and took her back and uh, just point to a couple of verses and talk about that it's symbolic of, uh, of how god is going to allow uh, his people and he allows us to backslide but that uh, at some point he'd be willing to welcome us home uh, with loving arms so isaiah 2 2 plead with your mother plead for she is not my wife neither am i her husband let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. Then we jump ahead to Hosea 14, and this is where it's symbolic of when God is going to uh, receive. This is, and this is prophecy. It's not happened yet. It's going to happen in the future. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with your words and turn to the Lord, say unto him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. So we will render the calves of our lips. A shaw shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses. Neither will we say any more to the work of our hands. Ye are our gods, for in thee the fatherless findeth mercy. I will, I will. I will heal thy backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. So at some point, God, after the uh, punishment is over, is going to be willing to receive them back and love them again. So it's a, it's a, uh, Hosea is a, that's the basic idea behind the book. Okay, back to Ezekiel 23, 19. Yes, yeah, she multiplied her whoredoms and calling to remembrance the days of her youth where she had played the harlot in the land of Egypt. So this is leading up to this, kind of like I was talking about, is it kind of like that uh, man who uh, gets in his older years, and all of a sudden wants to relive uh, his uh, his younger years again and start seeking for that, uh, that uh, instead of remembering the uh, love of his life that he had and the, uh, at one point, you know, Israel was working really well with, uh, with God and that uh, they had a great relationship. But here they were remembering back to being uh, the harlots in Egypt and thinking back to that time of being, of defying God. And we see this over in Leviticus 18.3 when it talks about what God expects. After the doings of the land of Egypt wherein he dwelt, 
shall ye not do, and after the doings of the land of Canaan, whether I bring you, shall ye not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. This is what God originally told him that, that told them not to do the things you see done in in Egypt. Okay, verse 20. For she dotted upon their paramours, whose flesh is as the flesh of asses, and whose issue is like the issue of horses. Now, uh, I won't say a whole lot about what these words actually mean, except that paramours has to do with concubines. So these would be uh, women uh, in a harem kind of a situation uh, that taking back to like King Solomon, uh, who had many, many wives and, and concubines, and whose flesh is as flesh of asses, meaning it's uh, kind of symbolizing that uh, that that's young and youthful and uh, and uh, desirable. Uh, and this is talking about the relationship between what's happening in Judea and some of the other countries around them. Well, I found interesting. I'm going to look up what issue is. Uh, and whose issue is like the issue of horses. And if you want to look up in the Greek what issues means, you'll get the idea of what I'm talking about. But let's just say it's a very sexual term, uh, in my opinion. But that uh, that's the verse I was talking about. Okay, Jeremiah 5, 8. And, but basically what he's trying to say there is that uh, that these other countries and what they offered were very desirable to Israel. They were forgetting about God. So they were performing adultery, uh, both spiritually and physically with these other countries because they were desirable. And the best I can I can portray it is, it's kind of like that uh, young lady that uh, you know, sees a man that's very uh, muscular and built and really strong looking and uh, very, desire, very uh, pleasant to look at. And, and, and that that was attracting them to forget about God and to go go their own way and do do something that God wouldn't like. So that's basically what that's talking about. But also the other thing that happened uh, by doing this, and the part that's really bad is that if you remember back in, if you ever read it back in Deuteronomy, uh, let me read Jeremiah here first. This is a, a compliment verse to what I was just reading. They were fed as fed horses in the morning, every one neighbor after his neighbor's wife. So here's the same idea that uh, Jeremiah is portraying here, that they were committing adultery with uh, these other nations by uh, interacting with them and by actually intermarriage with them. And that's the other aspect uh, that uh, they're, the law they're breaking is that uh, the original commandment was that the Jews were not supposed to marry outside their uh, nation because of the idolatry that these other nations were uh, were doing. And so that's the other area that God is angry about. And so that uh, uh, over in Deuteronomy 7, 3 and 4, it talks about that. Neither shall thy make marriages with them that thy daughter that shall not give unto his son nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. Just talking about uh, they shouldn't marry outside the faith, outside the Jewish nation. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. Also, also in uh, Malachi 2.11, Judith has dealt treacherously and abomination is committed in Israel and in Jews Jerusalem. But Judea hath profaned the holiness of the Lord which he loved and hath married the daughter of a strange God. <clears throat> so under Ezekiel 20 through 21, and so you can see here they're breaking a couple of rules here. They're, they, they're marrying outside the faith by going to other countries. And it, uh, uh, and that's the uh, main thing, one of the main things that they're breaking the rules here, which is going to uh, corrupt. And that's why God had basically had uh, the Northern Kingdom uh, destroyed, but the problem he had is that with the Southern Kingdom is that he had still had to protect the line uh, for Jesus to be born. And so luckily he was able to take uh, that line out of and protect it by taking them away from Babylon. So that's why Judea wasn't actually destroyed completely during the first and second siege as it uh, to maintain the line to Jesus was uh, 
had to be protected. And that's kind of how it uh, happened. Now, I'm trying to remember the exact line. You know, Jesus was born out of the uh, tribe of Judah. And King David through Solomon is kind of a weird relationship here is that uh, during the same time frame uh, is when uh, the book of Ruth happened and Ruth had uh, had left to go to Moab talking about going to an outside country, but she kept herself pure in much that <clears throat> her sons did marry outside the faith. But the, those girls ended up turning to the faith. Well, one of them did, and that was uh, uh, Ruth, <clears throat> Naomi, I should say. And so Ruth, even though she was a Moabitess, turned, uh, became a uh, Jew <clears throat> and followed Naomi back to Bethlehem. And that meaning Boaz, which Boaz was in the kingly line of uh, of Jesus. And that, <clears throat> that's how they kept the line pure. Kind of a fascinating story when you follow it. Oh, my throat. <clears throat> well, that whole thing is uh, maybe one of these days we'll, we'll, we'll do a little side trip on that one when it comes to how God protected the uh, the bloodline of Jesus through, through this time frame. Let's see, where was I? Oh, Ezekiel 23 21. Thus thou uh, callest to remembrance the lewdness of thy youth and bruising thy teeth by the Egyptians for the paps of thy youth. Again, we're on that same line of uh, committing adultery on many different levels, you know, not only uh, spiritually, but physically also. So I'll we'll end up here with Ezekiel 17, 15 as a complement to this verse. But he rebelled against him in sending his ambassadors to Egypt that they might give him horses and much people. Shall he prosper? Shall he escape that doeth such things? Or shall he break the covenant and be delivered? So uh, and again, uh, Judea was trying to find help to, to beat off the Assyrians. And so they turned to Egypt also, doing everything that God was telling, trying to explain him not to do. Uh, and they were still doing it. And that's why, and ultimately, God did protect them by uh, having them taken over and taken into captivity. And then killing off the people who actually made these decisions. So I hope that wasn't too confusing. It's quite a parable and uh, quite to dig into it. And so we'll end there today and we'll go on and talk about the punishment that God's going to do. And the next section is actually called the Babylonian invasion. So that we're going to get away from the parable a little bit. And uh, actually, no, it's still in the parable, it's still part of the parable. So, but it's not about the two sisters anymore. Uh, it's talking about the uh, Babylonian invasion coming up next. So we'll talk about that tomorrow. And a little prayer. Thank you, Lord, so much for this time to look into your word. Thank you so much for uh, all the things we get to learn from your word and that uh, we can help to apply them to our lives and remember that uh, what, what, uh, what we need to do in this time frame to stay uh, true to your word. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. Okay, I'll talk to you all later. Have a great day.